welcome to the Arena Decklist Podcast. I am Jerry Thompson. Here with me, as always, is Brian Gottlieb, and we are here to talk about some standard, which is kind of weird because we're about to get a new set, but uh, Arena is doing their once every three months WMCQ PTQ business thing. Well summed up. I think you, you did a great job of uh, expressing our present understanding of the system. I, I'm not going to pretend to know all the ins and outs, but I do know there's an event that a bunch of people care about this weekend. And so we thought we should do our best to set people up for success in that event. We talked about doing modern on this episode, if you listened to us last week, but I think we have to give the people what they want. And I also think everyone hates modern right now. So I really don't want to talk about it. It doesn't seem like the right time to go in on that episode. Play Oko, play Urza. Urza till I take it away from you. That's the end of the story. I I like having best deck or two or three in order to try and target in fight. So I've been kind of enjoying it. But yes, having everything be Simic Oko nonsense is obviously not healthy for the format. And we'll see what happens. But Yeah, we are the Arena Deckless Podcast. There is an Arena PTQ type of thing this weekend. I am qualified. I am going to try and play in it. It it is a little weird where it starts at 6 a.m. my time. We'll see what happens. But either way, I have been working on the format a, a little bit, a decent amount. It's really difficult to get my eyes and mind off of the Theros previews, but I'm doing my best. Yeah, my focus has been turned more towards Theros at this point. Of course, I am doing a show for SCG this weekend, so will not be playing this qualifier. I have done a show every single time. There has been a qualifier. I have not missed one, so had to keep that hot streak alive. Going to be down in Knoxville, bringing you some exciting modern action. So no time to play this event. Uh, But I have been playing occasional games of Standard. I'm not going to pretend like I've spent my time entirely plugged in definitely have done more in the modern space and the pioneer space and just brewing future decks but i do think i have a sense of where things stand now and some useful insight to hand to folks who are preparing for this event cool well before that there is the theros streamer showcase which you are now a part of yay clap 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 there yeah, we go. I'm, I'm thrilled to do that. Uh, it's going to be really cool. I'm happy to have access to the cards as early as possible. I don't know if you remembered for Throne of Eldraine release. I had a Fandom Legends on the day of release, but no access to the streamer showcase. So I had to watch all of my opponents get to test their decks and know exactly what they wanted to play. And I had to do my best guess at the format. I won anyway, spoiler, but... It doesn't always work out that way, and I'm happy this time to have access to the cards and actually get in the mix as we set up for the very, very early days of the format. Yeah, and there's not any Fandom Legends or Twitch Rivals or anything like that going on that we know of, right? No, no, I haven't been told of anything, unfortunately, so it doesn't seem like there will be that day one tournament to really set the meta, Uh, so it's going to be on us to figure it out and set our people up for their first event of the format. Dude, I'm, I'm up for it. Let's do it. Me too. I'm excited about the set. The set's been fun. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of playable cards too, which is pretty exciting. Yep. And nothing seems like egregiously busted. But yeah, last time for Throne of Eldraine, we were posting decklists consistently over at arenadecklist.gg. And I think that we are going to do that again this time around. So uh, definitely be on the lookout for that on social media, Twitter and whatnot. We'll post links to that and new decklists as they come up. But do you have any plans for the the streamer showcase, like what you're going to try and do? I know that you're traveling on that day, so the amount of time that you get to dedicate to the actual event itself might be limited. But uh, are you just going to build a few brews beforehand and then just kind of play those? Well, I'll tell you, my Scryfall account is already getting full of decks. A lot of it over the course of the last few weeks with you know my writing for SCG. But as soon as the full spoiler hits, I'm sure I will go into crazy mode and just be jamming out decks left and right. And whatever is exciting me the most at the moment is where I will focus my attention. But I think we're going to have a little bit of a sweat come Wednesday. And I need all of the Arena Deckless fandom to be pulling for me because... Like you said, I I am traveling that day. I'm flying in from Florida 
And Seattle is slated to just get like snow every single day for the next week, basically. So if my flight does not make it back, it will be challenging to get streams done. Everyone has to pray for nice weather and a successful flight for me on Wednesday. Dude, I'm so good at this. I swear every time it snows in Seattle, I'm out of town. Well, I'm nailing that part, like the start of it anyway. It's supposed to start snowing on either Saturday or Sunday. I don't remember. I'll be in Knoxville, then headed to Florida. So I'm actually going to some really nice climates, some really warm weather. It's just the coming back thing that could be a problem if the snow continues for any extended period of time. Right. Uh, so right. we'll just have to we'll have to keep our fingers crossed. As far as like special plans, now we're just going to be testing decks and figuring out what what is best. That's always our goal. Right. Okay. So last thing that we want to talk about, well, maybe maybe there are two things, actually, I might have lied, is the Hunter Burton Memorial Open coming up. Uh, I don't think they've made any official announcement for this year's date, but I do believe that it's going to, it is tentatively scheduled for the end of March. And Oh, uh, oh no, Gerald. Oh, no. I, I have to correct you. Their official announcement came out today, which is oh. specifically why I wanted to talk about it. Uh, I, I just some- checked their website and I didn't see anything. Mm-mm. And there is some some great news attached to it. I'm going to pull up the announcement right now. Give me one moment. Was it on Facebook? Uh, I saw it through our friend Daquan, who we did commentary with last year, retweeted it over on Twitter. And I retweeted it. So if you're following my Twitter account, you've probably seen it by now. Uh, oh, it is. What they it is on the website. What they have announced is that the main event is a $10,000 modern tournament with a player's tour invite attached for the winner, which is awesome. And then the Sunday event is a $5,000 pioneer tournament with a player's tour qualification also attached to it. So two PT invites going to be given out at the Hunter Burton Memorial open. And look, there could be literally no prizes, no PT events, and I would still want to be there. That's how good this event is. But adding this to the mix just makes this a no brainer. You have to go to the Hunter Burton Memorial open March 27th, through 29th is the date. Yeah, beautiful. Confirmed. Okay. And we will be there. I'm not sure in what capacity we're going to be there. Last year we did commentary, but I do enjoy being on the floor and interacting with everyone that's around and everything. So might try and do that this year. We'll see how it all shakes out. Yeah, I, I will be involved in whatever capacity I can best benefit the event. Like you, I felt a little sectioned off doing commentary and it would be nice to get out on the floor. So we'll talk with our friends at the Hunter Bird Memorial Open and we'll be there. We'll help out however we can. And it's going to be a really great time. Obviously the Hunter Burton Memorial Open to raise awareness and to raise money for suicide prevention, something super close to both of our hearts. I know I obviously lost a very close friend this past year, Alex Stratton to suicide. I've lost many friends and family along the way. And whatever I can do for this cause, I'm more than happy to do. Yeah, uh, it, it hasn't hit me. You know, it hasn't been as close, you know, the, as other people I know. But, you know, like I knew Alex and I had several magic acquaintances and friends that I've also lost to suicide. It, it hasn't ever been, you know, someone who's super close to me or whatever. But it's like I I totally see the impact that it has on the loved ones of those people and certainly on those individuals themselves, you know? So it it is a thing that is also very, very important to me, especially because a lot of it tends to be related to mental illness and depression and stuff like that. And it, it all matters. It's all kind of like linked together and I care very deeply about it. And this is an event that I I've said, I'm going to be at every single year. You can't stop me. Yeah. So a little bit of a somber note there, but I assure you while the event has a somber purpose, the actual proceedings are anything but. It is a celebration of magic. The community really comes together. It it feels very different. Everything is so positive and just so warm and welcoming. And it really is an event I hope everyone can make it down to this year. Yeah. The the experience at the event kind of shook me a little bit because it was not what I was used to being around and participating in, like going to a magic tournament where there are relatively high stakes, but because of the message and the cause, everyone is there to support something bigger than just, you know, who wins the tournament or whatever. So there's not a lot of negativity in the the tournament hall. Like people are not 
really espousing like their bad luck or anything like that. Like they are there to support a good cause and people are just there playing high level tournament magic and having fun. And the only other time I've felt that sort of energy in the room is actually like at a command fest. Like I went to the ones in Seattle and DC and it, it felt very similar. Like people just in a room playing magic, having fun. And it's, it's exactly what it should be, man. hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. So last thing, uh, we got some arena deckless deck boxes in from our friends over at Ooh. ultra pro. Yo, these deck boxes, these these are something else. Look, when we made the decision to change the name of this podcast and change the logo of this podcast, we knew it was strange and high risk, but a huge portion of it was getting to a place where we had a logo that we were just stoked to see on merchandise and stoked to put out there and have represent us. And when you see these deck boxes, I think you'll get it. I think you'll understand why we wanted to make this change and they just look so, so good. And I, I can't wait to start getting them in people's hands. Yeah, the, the shirts went out too from MTG Pro Shop and people are yep, also look starting, great. Yeah, starting to post pictures of them wearing their swag in, in our Discord and everything. And it is rad. I do, th- I do agree with you. I think the logo looks good on, on the shirts. It looks very nice on the deck box. Brian tweeted a picture of the deck box. So if, if y'all want to check out what it looks like, it's like the... 100 count ultra pro one. So if you've gotten like a channel fireball one from a random GP or something like that, it is, it is effectively that, but with our logo. So it looks dope. Yeah, it looks amazing. I, I can't wait to have these in my hands. Of course, all of these goodies available through our Patreon page, always support y'all checking that out and seeing what we offer to our patrons. We do our best to provide a little value, get some nice merch in everyone's hands and also just foster a really strong community over in our discord. So I highly recommend everyone checks out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash arena deck lists. On to the show. We have Let's do it. the last standard event before Theros. I know that I'm sure a lot of people are in the same place as us where they are looking forward to the previews and the new decks and all that sort of stuff. But first things first, we have this last tournament and this is a big deal. This is a thing where had it not existed, people like Chris Kavartek, like y- you might not know his name. You know, uh, this right. is a big deal where you actually get to qualify for one of the arena mythic invitationals, I suppose, is the current nomenclature. And you qualify for this like 68 player tournament with huge amounts of equity. And it just matters a ton. There's a lot of mythic points at stake. There, like this is probably your best path into rivals and MPL and stuff like that. And it's not, you know, small, fast process or anything like that. It is very much like the reward of people being able to grind to top mythic and stay there and wait three months for this qualifier to actually roll around. And then this itself is a two day event. And we've seen. No, 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 no. No. Hold on. It's only not two days. It's one day now, and y- you got to go like 10 and 1 to make the cut. That is one of the changes with Arena OP in this year. Did they say that they were going back to a two day model after this or something? It is possible that's the case. I okay. am not familiar with that announcement, though. All I know is that this one is, is a one day event. People okay. have been talking a lot about the impact of like basically having to get real hot to lock up your spot here. And if that changes deck selection and setup and all that, spoiler, it mostly doesn't. But yeah, you got you got to have a big performance all across one day to make the cut here. Okay. Yeah. One day event. My bad. I had read some stuff about like them changing it. And I didn't know if that was uh, in effect for this one. I suppose that bodes well for me because I'm flying on Sunday. So even if I did make day two, okay. it would probably be difficult for me to play so yeah just gotta run hotter than the sun go 10 and 1 10 and fun and no big deal so do you want to talk about the format itself specifically like the format of the tournament because before it it being a two-day event and you know you said that people were talking about like oh well you have to go 10 and 1 instead of 7 and 2 or 8 and 2 and then 5 1 5 2 on the second day you need a higher win rate overall how, if at all, does that change things? The The only thing that changes is that previously day two was open deckless. That is meaningful. 
that that is a real change that actually influences games and requires some adaptations. Although the fact that you had to get through a gauntlet to even get to that place means you might have been incentivized to ignore that anyway. But that's besides the point. That was something you could have considered before. In terms of just like you need to do really well, I, I don't understand how that affects what you were trying to do in a given tournament. And people always present it as like, oh, now I'm more incentivized to take this lark. Well, not not really. Like you always needed a really strong record. And if this lark is your best chance to get a really strong record, then you should have done it anyway. I don't really understand the difference here. I don't think there's a huge difference between a deck that's attempting to go 10 and 1 and a deck that is attempting to go 7-2. They look exactly the same to me. If you feel differently, let me know, Jerry. If you can present a reason why you should approach this any differently, please tell me, but I, I just can't bring myself to see it. I think that people want to appear smart a lot of the time. I mean, you're presented with this somewhat unique problem and you would think that there is a way to game the system, right? Like gamers going to game and they're going to see that you need basically like a 90% win percentage and be like, oh, well, that means that I should play a high variance deck or something that has very polarizing matchups and just like hope to mize, hope to get lucky. And I... I agree with you. I don't think that it necessarily changes much. I think that you should play the deck that you think gives you the highest win percentage and say that you are 70% with Jun Food. You know, that that's a 7-3 and three record, assuming that it breaks exactly like that. But that's not going to be the case. I mean, if in any given Grand Prix, you have to go like 12 and 3, 12 to 1, 13 2, something like that to make top 8 and there's there's no deck that has that kind of consistent win percentage, right? But like if you are playing a deck that has a 70% win percentage, that gives you a much better shot of, you know, maybe getting lucky in some spots, outplaying some people, having better mirror match technology or understanding and that's how you pick up your extra percentage points versus playing something like I don't know, <clears throat> some hyper linear aggro mono red deck or whatever that's like maybe 40 percent against the field but like oh if i play against simic flash all day i'll have like a 90 percent win rate it's just like no that that doesn't really make sense you don't have to gamble like that you should just play the thing with the best win percentage across the board unless you truly believe that the metagame is going to be something like 80 percent of a specific archetype but that's not going to be the case right the the other argument you can make and if you are this good at predicting metagames, then uh, don't listen to this show because you're way better than either of us. If you know authoritatively, like a tournament stretched to infinity is going to always yield a specific set of decks standing on top at the end, like you just have this metagame pinned down and you know this is going to happen, then there is some incentive to, as the tournament gets longer and as you need more wins to actually get the result you want, to start playing decks which are effective against that deck. But if you have identified that deck, then you have to answer the question, well, why aren't you just playing that? Like if there is an actual best deck that as Infinity stretches on is going to put itself ahead, then you're pretty incentivized to play that because you know that for a fact and your gamble that like, okay, I think I can hard target this deck. And if things all break that way and I get through the first four to five rounds, I'm sitting pretty. I would just go with the default best deck in that scenario. I don't think you have to make that kind of gambit. So right. I, I know there was a point in my career where I felt differently about this, specifically as it came to pro tours. And I honestly think like in retrospect, that was me masking a lot of insecurity with some faulty logic. Like I always had the opinion of, oh, you should take a shot at the PT because you need a really sterling result anyway. But that doesn't quite make sense. And I think I was actually conflating the idea of having an unknown deck at a PT versus taking a shot at a PT. And I think having an unknown deck at a PT does bear some fruit. And it could certainly bear fruit in this event as well if you had a really, really good deck. Timing's a little different. Obviously, PTs used to be at the start of a format. So having something unknown was a little bit more plausible as opposed to now where this format has really been be beaten into the ground. But... I, I don't know. I just don't think this mode of thinking is all that useful. It's way more worthwhile to just figure out what you play best, what you think is best, and just push your chips in and commit to it. Yeah. And obviously try and hedge 
against certain metagame considerations. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but for example, uh, Rakdos Knights is the deck that has kind of like recently r- risen to the top because it is quite good against the flash decks and people just in general were not playing a lot of cards that were good against it. So a, a lot mm-hmm. of the hate cards died down. People did not have as many answers to Embercleave. Things like Aethergust were just not as prevalent. And even things just like Rotting Regisaur were, were very large and people did not have good answers to. So that's one of the things where it's like, okay, you know, that that's a deck that you certainly have to account for but I don't think that you necessarily need to make any hard reads. You should mostly just be making like soft read hedges where it's like, okay, I know that this is going to be a thing. I might play against it two, maybe three times. Maybe it's a little bit more likely that I play it towards like the tail end of the tournament rather than in the early rounds, but you can't make any hard justifications or deck choices just based on that knowledge alone. You just have to keep that in the back of your mind and, use that to help inform the small adjustments that you make to your deck. Yeah. So we've said this a couple times with the last two arena MCQs where there are 7,200 players that qualify because it's top 1200 mythic for standard or for, Oh no, I guess it's more now actually because it's top 1200 for the constructed ladder and the, limited ladder right and historic has a separate ladder than standard i don't i don't think that's correct okay wild i I think the (laughs) i think the constructed ladder is the constructed ladder and it contemplates both historic and and then the the standard format and then best of one also factors into those things like it's also on the same ladder okay so yeah it is 7200 slots that are available for this mcq Theoretically, I I don't think limited fills up. Like, I don't think you, if you, (coughs) excuse me, if you make mythic and limited, I am pretty sure you're set and you don't get ranked out. Okay. I mean, and there are also people who uh, hit mythic in both, like top 1200 in both. And there are people who would be top 1200 multiple months in a row. So there are some people who take multiple slots up, but in theory, there's 7,200 slots. Uh, some people take up multiple slots. There are people like you who are doing things on the weekend. So you're not going to get a full 7,200 players in the tournament. Maybe you get 60% of the people who qualify, maybe a little less. Uh, so the tournament is going to be rather large and there are going to be people who are free to play on arena and people who have qualified through limited and don't play a lot of constructed. So in the, the first few rounds, for sure, there are going to be a lot of random decks and decks that are not necessarily optimal, decks that you have not prepared for, and maybe just decks that existed three months ago, right? So hard targeting certain things in the metagame is just not a thing that you should be doing in this tournament. Yeah, I think it's a huge, huge push to just plain baseline powerful things less trying to nail that exact right spot. And when it comes to baseline, powerful things that reward tight play and mastery and knowledge of an archetype, I think there are several decks which stand head and shoulders above the others. I agree. So the thing that I am working on is... Jun Food, because I think it has the tools to compete with basically everything that's out there. Again, not trying to hard target anyone, but things like Thrashing Brontodon Main, for example, a card that is good against Jeskai Mm -hmm. Fires, is good against Rakdos Knights. If there are random artifacts and enchantments that show up, you know, that gives you some outs to it. Like maybe there's some white black Doom Foretold deck or Dance of the Man, stuff like that, where you know, Bronzodon is, is just going to cover you against a wide variety of things. Also, Fine in the Mirror can pick off Witch's Oven and Trailer Crumb, stuff like that. And then I saw a very interesting list from Magic Online from the Standard Challenge, got second place, and had two copies of Status Statue main deck. Yeah, starting to see that pop up in various places. And I think it's an interesting add. Obviously, more enchantment hate ways to deal with some of those sticky permanents on the battlefield the big bodies out of the fires decks you're cleaning up but also don't forget about that status mayhem devil combo to just obliterate opposing battlefields 
I think this card is cool. I heard about it a while ago now, like going back yeah. probably two or three weeks. Uh, I don't know that I bought in 100%, but it's been something that's been on my mind. And like you, if I were playing this tournament, I would still be playing Jun Food. And I think we have probably some explaining to do to make that statement. The last time we talked about playing Jun Food before an event was GP Portland. We were both high in the deck. And if you looked at statistics from GP Portland, Jun Food did not do great. Zero copies in the top eight. And I think a win rate floating somewhere around 48%. So to continue to hold this belief, we obviously are somewhat rejecting the conclusions from that event, which I'm comfortable doing. First of all, small sample size. Second of all, what I mostly saw was everyone standing exactly still with their Jund list, not making appropriate concessions to things like Rakdos Knights, which we had figured out was going to show up in force. Meanwhile, the people who did appropriately adapt, I'm thinking specifically of Emma Handy, who is the highest finishing Jund player in the entire tournament, just did fantastically well. And I know Emma continues to refine the deck. She posted a full guide over on her Patreon, which I am happy to plug here because Emma's fantastic. I, I retweeted it. Yeah, she's an example of if you commit to this archetype, it rewarding you with a high level of just payoff in all of your slot selection. And it's been this way from the beginning. I think of the first time I played this deck, there were some very pointed choices I was making while keeping this core very steady because the core is still the most bonkers thing you can be doing in standard. It's just good, good mid-range stuff. And you get a lot of flex slots where you can really tailor yourself for whatever you're expecting. But like you said, soft reads. You're always going to have that really hard, powerful core at the center. And then all these little ancillary tweaks you can make on top to give you edges if you can really figure out what you're going to be playing against. Right. And I agree with you 100%. I think that the Jundex did not adapt to, to Rakdos Knights going into GP Portland. And Certainly, I was among them. Like, I was very worried about Fires and the various Simic decks and stuff like that, the mirror matches. So I was playing Fires of Invention and Casualties of War in my Jun Food deck. And by the time Portland rolled around and we were actually there and all these people are talking about Rakdos Knights and how good it is, it's like, well, I can't play that version of the deck anymore, right? Like, if if I were playing Jun yeah. Food in that main event, I would have had to probably, you know, completely changed those eight flex slots that I had. And the same thing is true now, where I am more interested in status statue, Masker Girl, Thrashing Brontodon, things of that nature, yep. far less interested in casualties of war, fires of invention. Agree entirely. And if you if you looked at the magic online results, they bore this out immediately after that GP Jun Food crushed the, I don't know if it was the challenge or a PTQ, I, I don't remember specifically which event it was, but it was just loaded with Jund and the decks had adapted and they just closed out Rakdos Knights. And I actually think Rakdos Knights trending down super hard at this point because the adaptations have been made and they they effectively squeeze the deck out of the format. So where are the Simic decks now? Like, I, I do think that the... The lower to the ground the Jun decks get, the better they are against Simic because Simic is very good yes. at, you know, trying trying to keep their board clear, countering any sort of like three, four, five mana card that the Jun deck can play. But the quicker that Jund is able to get into double spell territory, and certainly the more interaction they have for things like Nightpack Ambusher, the less likely it is that Simic actually gets to run away with the game. And I think that because Rakdos Knights popped up and it was good against Simic and it made Jund adapt to Rakdos Knights, that also just bodes well for the Jund v. Simic matchup. Yeah, th- this is so cool, what I, what I want to talk through right now. And I hope I effectively check all the boxes and convey exactly what I'm trying to get at because it's kind of complicated, all the ripples that are happening. But I think Hit your me. assessment is correct. Jund has adapted and isn't worrying about certain things anymore, so has found its way under these Simic flash decks. Not to say the matchup is super lopsided. I think all of these matchups are all very close. Agreed. So Agreed. we're talking about ranges of 45 55% here, but it's still worth exploring. So all this change happens. Jund finds itself in a positive place against the flash decks. Flash not really sure what it's supposed to be preying on right now, whereas we move away from six mana spells, still with a fine Fires matchup. But again, Fires players 
they're getting rewarded with a good matchup against things like Knights so they can start thinking, okay, well, now I'm going to set myself up for Simic and find a better matchup there. So that matchup's getting tighter. So what all this actually conspires to do is push Simic back to what I believe is a better version of Simic for this tournament. And that's the Simic ramp setups based around like Finale of Devastation, Cavalier of Thorns, because they can actually go bigger than the Jun decks right. and they have a reasonable plan to outscale them. So now it's like this arms race where Jun snuck below Simic Flash. So Simic is re-incentivized to go large and just overpower those decks. And my two favorite decks going into this weekend are Jund and Simic, not Flash, but Simic Ramp. And it's weird because for a long time, I was against this deck and I was having a really hard time putting into words exactly why, number one, I found myself playing with it. And number two, I found myself winning with it a lot, like just a really successful win rate. But it's exactly this ripple effect. And the Simic ramp deck, if it has a flaw, it does not deal with early aggression well. It really does get beat up by the Rakdos Knights deck pretty effectively. Ember Cleave's a problem card. You can build towards it, but ultimately I think that matchup is always going to lean in the Rakdos Knights player's favor. But every other deck has caught up to Rakdos Knights. It's forcing things in another direction, and now I think it's become a pretty safe choice, and maybe one of the secret pieces of tech that is floating around for this MCQ weekend, if you have some Simic ramp experience, I urge you to spend these next couple of days reacquainting yourself with that deck and its matchups because I, I do think there's fruit on the tree there. Yeah, I, I think that I agree with what you're saying as far as like base matchup strategy and, and how things are going to bore out. Like Simic ramp against the non-casualties of war jun food decks where they have like thrashing brontodon instead of six mana cards like yeah ramp is just gonna kind of overpower them uh things like status statue could certainly help that a little bit where you know maybe you just get these turns where you get to pick off like a big crisis and a cavalier of thorns and a nissa land or whatever and that allows the jun deck to get aggressive but for the most part civic yeah. ramp in games that are going long they're just gonna dominate and if they are able to change up a few flex slots, like, again, Thrashing Brontodon, I think, is a card that is very well positioned against uh, the Rakdos Knights deck, where it just makes it so you don't have to worry about Embercleave as much. You know, you just make a few small concessions here or there to respect the Rakdos deck, and what you said is still true. They're still not that great against early aggression, just in general, but things like Brontodon, maybe a another early play or two, maybe some main deck Aether Gust, something like that. Like it could go a long way. I think you're right. The other misconception I hear a lot about the Simic Ramp deck is that, oh, it just gets farmed by Simic Flash. I, I think you can build around that problem too. And that's where I started was I thought, I thought Simic Flash was still being pretty overrepresented on ladder. I think that is now mostly corrected and it's trending down so you don't have to go as far. But when I had four... Uh, shifting Ceratops in my sideboard. Like, I don't know that I'm willing to say the matchup is net favorable for Simic Ramp, but as I was climbing up the ladder, maybe playing against a little bit worse competition, I was certainly winning more matches than I was losing by like a pretty significant margin because I had figured out my game plan in post board games and it was working. Like, you get a little bit leaner, you have some uncounterable threats, and you are able to find effective pressure against them in a lot of instances. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, you you do have to have a fairly cohesive board plan. And like, for example, the first list that yep. shows up on Goldfish I'm looking at now has things like four Aether Gusts, four Mystical Dispute, four Shifting Ceratops. And it's like, yeah, that is that is a plan against Flash right there. You have I was I was boarding eleven. Yeah, I was I was boarding eleven. It was great. Right. And I think that if Flash is prepared for stuff like that, they can try to mitigate that to some degree like obviously you should sideboard how you should sideboard against your opponent's sideboard plan not against their main deck and i think that that is probably what a lot of people do in the matchup where it's like well these three mana counter spells are just excellent because my opponent has a bunch of cavalier of thorns and this and stuff and then they just lower their mana curve completely cut all the big top end stuff and just give you the beatdowns. and yeah the, the flash deck is just like oh what the hell happened you know but if they are ready for that sort of thing i think that they, they have a chance, but yeah, you're such a huge favorite post-board. The problem is, is that your your game one percentage is so bad. It's not great. Yeah. It's not great. Uh, you just don't line up in a 
your your game plans are so diametrically opposed that they could just get to sit there forever and eventually kill you. You can't interact with any of their big threats. All of your stuff is really expensive. You get murdered in game one, and there's no way around it. But game two, you get to play a fish mirror, and I'll I'll take my chances in fish mirrors all day. Happy to play those. Well, especially if your opponent's not sideboarding for a fish mirror, you know? Sure, sure. They, Great point. They just get bamboozled. So I think overall, a lot of people are going to respect Rakdos. They are going to assume that Simic, at least the Flash variants, are on the decline. That likely leads to a higher proliferation in Jun Food and Jeskai Fires. Yes, that tracks to me. But we we got to talk about Jeskai Fires. <laughs> there has to be some... I, I mean, I don't even know how to reconcile the continued presence of this deck in the format. And Look, if you look at the stats from Portland, they say Fires did really well. I, I can't dispute those numbers. When I play this deck, I hate it. I hate everything about it. I don't understand registering this deck for any tournament. I think it is just fundamentally flawed. And yet I'm obviously missing something. Like this is on me. I'm not putting it on the deck at this point because it continues to post solid numbers. It continues to do well. And I really want to check whatever bias I am holding against it. So every few weeks I do go back to this deck and I, I'm like, okay, I'm going to play a day of Jeskai Fires on ladder. I inevitably get absolutely obliterated and it reinforces my belief that this is not a real deck. Where are you at at this point? I know you've been low historically. Has anything changed your mind? Are you starting to be a believer in this archetype? Because I think there is a possibility it's actually the most played deck this MCQ weekend. Yeah, I, be I believe that it will be. If you don't know exactly what's going on in the metagame and how people are going to react and adapt and all that stuff, uh, just Guy is just a fine deck. You don't have to worry about all of the minutia involved with tuning your Jun food deck or tuning your Simic ramp deck. From the Rakdos Knights perspective, there are things like Witch's Vengeance creaming up in a lot of the food deck sideboards and Brontodon's main. Like, life is getting a lot harder for them. And Jeskai Fires has been the most popular deck for quite a while, basically since the bannings happened, right? And yeah. people have known that. They have tried to adapt to it, and yet Fires is still the most popular deck. It still wins a very healthy amount of tournaments. And as far as the specifics are concerned, I'm kind of right there with you where you play games with the deck and if you get to play fires on turn four or turn five, you feel great. If you don't get to play fires, it feels like you are starting the game from a huge deficit. And certainly you or I don't like that feeling. We want to have more agency and not just rely on whether or not you draw or find a specific copy of a card to enable your strategy. And I don't want to say that like, oh, the people who win tournaments are the people who draw or resolve fires more often because that's not it. Like, obviously, they are very well equated to like playing the games when they don't have fires. Like they are comfortable doing that. And right. they have they have success doing that. I just don't think it's like a thing that you or I are comfortable doing or feel like, you know, that that makes for like the hallmark of a good deck or whatever. We're not super happy to register it because yes, sometimes you do have the nut draws and you just annihilate people, which I think is the reason to play this deck is because when you have fires, you just kind of go off and you kill people very quickly and there's not a whole lot they can do. It's finding the best balance between leaning into your nut draws, being able to like when you have those draws come together, like it should translate into a win and ensuring that you are able to translate that into a win, but you need to figure out exactly what you're supposed to be doing when you don't have fires. Yeah. I don't have an answer for that question. It's weird. I want to push back against the idea that I won't sign up for this type of deck. Cause like I, I played a bunch of Tron and someone in our discord made the Tron to fires analogy. And I think it really does make a lot of sense. It's it very does. easy to dismiss it. It's very easy to dismiss fires and just say, Oh, you drew fires. That's the end of it. But that's not what fires is all about. It's about effectively managing those early setup turns. And just the same way Tron is like optimizing your chances of putting together those draws and understanding what's important and understanding how to play the game where that doesn't come together and knowing when you have to shift in sideboarding, like all these things are the reasons we see really, really good Tron players win a lot. It's not because 
they just are more lucky than the other Tron players. It's because they understand the deck and there is something to be understood. Like, sure, there are stomps, but finding ways to win in those other games is just as interesting, just as valid, just as skill testing. So I'm totally off the idea of like fires not being a high skill deck. That stuff doesn't fly with me. There's tons of skill in all games of magic. Certainly, you need a level of mastery to play this deck well. But for for me, for whatever reason, it just doesn't click, and I I can't get myself there. I would love to get some coaching from a fires master to Pika. show me all the mistakes I'm making. I, I'm yeah, I'm sh- I'm sure I'm just throwing games away all over the place, and there's things I'm missing. But this isn't the type of deck where I would expect to make those kind of mistakes because I do think like while I may not trend in this direction for deck selection, I think I am suited to play these games. I think I understand probability and playing towards my outs very well, which I think fires incentivizes. So I don't know why it hasn't clicked for me, but I am mostly content at this point to place this as a me problem and not a deck problem and defend this as a reasonable choice if you are invested in this archetype at this point. I'm not though. So not going to pick it up now. It doesn't show me anything specifically that draws me to it. Like nothing about this metagame makes me say, yes, now is the time for fires. So I'm not going to pick it up in the dark at this point. I would say that in the dark, fires likely has the best win percentage against any given field. Like if, if we're talking about you should play proactive, powerful. Sure. Right. If we're, if we're talking about, we should play the most proactive, powerful thing that will have the best win percentage. This checks basically all the boxes, man. You can think that, Oh, I'm taking a lot of game actions with John food. And it has like this very cohesive, compact engine. And I get to kind of like sprinkle in soft read cards around this engine to be able to interact with everyone in a a reasonable, favorable manner. And you have a lot of good sideboard options, stuff like that. But like realistically, you're you're nickel and diming them with Jun Food, right? You're not necessarily doing anything super busted unless you have like Corvold, Mayhem Devil, that sort of stuff. Yeah. And Jeskai Fires is is just about the busted stuff, you know. It has it has good removal, it has good mana, a lot of uh, velocity and card advantage type of stuff, and you just have this sort of like combo kill. And I think, yeah, you just need to better acquaint yourself in the games where you don't have fires and know what your plan is in any given matchup on any given turn. And I think the problem might be that a lot of the cards are very similar to just normal control cards, right? Like you have Deafening Clarion and like some Justice Strikes and some Sweepers and big finishers. And maybe instead of playing this more controlling game when you don't have fires, you're supposed to be like, okay, well, like how do I buy enough time to maximize the ability to like find fires and set up a combo kill? I think that might be the difference, but I'm not, that's that I'm not even necessarily sure that that's how, the, the masters of this archetype play it necessarily. But I just feel like that might be the one thing that you are missing because I agree with you. This this should be a deck in uh, certainly like the individual cards are cards that you are used to playing with. So I'm not sure where the actual disconnect is, but I, I'm right there with you. I suffer kind of in the same way where if I don't have fires, I just feel like I'm so behind and the deck is so clunky and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, aggression is a form of control that we often lose sight of pressuring your opponent's life total forces them to make decisions which grants you control correct so your point about forcing the action could be true i actually (laughs) i mean not to discount your point but like this is something that has crossed my mind and played some matches with the intent of just being like the most aggressive version of fire as possible and just really committing to that idea and didn't really see any kind of notable improvement, but like small sample size, I'm not discounting this possibility at all. I think it makes a lot of sense. One other thing I want to talk about, and maybe this comes off like condescending. I don't, I don't mean it that way, but I think it's an important thing that we often lose sight of. And when I lay it out, it's going to seem very obvious to the extent that it's almost not worth mentioning. But I, I do feel like when we have these discussions, it's something that people often lose sight of. There is a world where Fires wins 53% of its matches in this tournament overall, and Jund Food wins 48% of its matches in this tournament overall. And it was still correct 
for me to play John Food because my knowledge of the archetype combined with how I am able to build my sideboard actually made my win percentage with the deck closer to 57%. And that is never going to be reflected in the breakdown of the metagame. You're still going to see John Food as a 48% deck. I mean, this is essentially exactly the Emma situation from GP Portland. She's going to crush the tournament because she understands the deck immaculately and has a really great setup. And the deck's going to only put up a 48% win rate. And then you can point to Emma and say, oh, you played the wrong deck. No, she didn't. She 100% played the right deck in that tournament. Uh, it just isn't reflected in the data. And that's a really hard conclusion to reach. And there's a lot of bias you can build into making the statement like, oh, I played the correct deck, even though it posted you know, a 45% win rate in this tournament, I am sure I made the right decision. It's really easy to let yourself off the hook that way. So you have to be careful with these kind of conclusions, but I do want to just point it out as a possibility. Well, there there are two different discussions there. The first is that stock Jun food, likely with a bunch of casualties of war, went 48%. Emma, mm -hmm. with Emma's build of the deck, went, I mean, 12 and three, were, there were buys in the tournament. I assume Emma had two. Like, I don't know what that percentage is it's certainly better than 48 percent, right 70 something yeah right. 70 something so like emma's build of jun food went 70 percent. that was the correct right. version of jun food to play in that tournament the other versions were bad versions likely because once even if they got to the the tippy top tables they were going to get beat up by rectus real hard yeah the other thing is that you can make the argument that, okay, Jeskai Fires has a better win percentage uh, and will likely have a better win percentage this weekend than any version of Junk Food. And this is obviously completely hypothetical. This is not my actual advice. But you can make a case for like, well, if I play Junk Food, I'll have a higher win percentage than if I play Jeskai Fires. And that is true. And you should do that, certainly like when the the time comes closer to get to the tournament but i would caution against using that as an argument and a justification for playing a worse deck when you could if you had the opportunity to you could spend time learning right. just sky fires yeah i i totally agree with you and that that is not the point i'm trying to make at all it's it's like an actual legitimate I can tune this deck to a higher win percentage than i can tune anything else even playing at optimal version of Jeskai Fires. I actually think this deck is best position. All things being equal, all play optimal on all sides. This is still the correct decision is the point I'm trying to get at. But you, I, I, I understand why you're clarifying that. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I mean, it, it is very much the Emma situation, right? Like if people take the stock versions of Jun Food, I don't think that they're particularly good anymore because you need to change eight cards every single week in order to... Yep remain competitive with the current meta game. And I mean, even on magic online, there are things like the mono white aggro deck that's like popping up again. And between that and Rakdos and Simic flash, a lot of things have changed since everyone thought that just guy and Jun food were the only two decks in the format and that you needed to be main decking for casualties of war. Like we are well past right. that point. Yeah. Massacre girl seems strong again. Many changes have gone on right there with you. And if you're not accounting for them, you're going to lose. It, it goes back to like the amulet masters, right? Like it's very easy to say, oh, the amulet players, they're just better than the other players on the tour. So that's why amulet has done so well there and does so terribly everywhere else. No, their decks are eight or nine cards different on a week to week basis. And all of those changes matter. And they're only able to make those changes with years and years of mastery. And it's very easy to dismiss their accomplishments and say they're playing a suboptimal deck. They're just the ones who make the deck optimal in a lot of instances. Right. And I mean, the same kind of happened with Just Guy Fires, too, where leading up to the last Arena MC, people were playing Fires mm -hmm. and you could have just cut the Defting Clarions from your deck in that tournament because there, there were just no copies of Rakdos or Mono Red. I mean, there were a couple, obviously, but like there, there weren't a lot. And Clarion, for the most part, was pretty bad. Justice Strike would have been much better. And people started making that change not everyone but certainly a few people i saw making that change after the mc and then that's kind of when recto showed up again and it's like oh, okay crap we need these clarions back but there was a brief yeah. window where just guy could have made an adaptation like that and maybe perform better at that mc I, I know that i think one made top eight and it won the gp that happened that weekend also but 
even in a deck like that, where you're mostly just about power, you can make small adaptations like that to perform better in any given metagame. Yeah, I think this is like a fine moment to give this metagame credit for that fact. There has been good internal churn for the decks, like very meaningful adaptations, ways for you to get an edge. And I think that's extremely, extremely important for a healthy standard. I'll be honest, I, I'm mostly not a fan of the gameplay. Uh, I hope Theros does a lot to shake it up. But in terms of a balanced metagame that deck builders and archetype aficionados can really succeed in, this this is a strong standard for that, for sure. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. And I mean, that's that's the kind of stuff that I'm looking for whenever I comb through these deck lists, because the archetypes for the most part don't change, but they're, they're static. Yeah. Yeah. The the metagame proliferation definitely waxes and wanes. And then how people are choosing to adapt to the new metagame also changes quite a bit. And it is really cool to see people actually being cognizant of that. And, you know, like I said, like the, the deck that got second in the challenge like went back to Wicked Wolf and didn't have Casualties of War and had Status Statue and Thrashing Bronzedon and stuff like that. I'm just like, yeah, this this person gets it. So, Jung Food in the hands of Brian Gottlieb with a Brian Gottlieb approved list and sideboarding guide. Great. Well, let's get someone better. Let's get someone better to do this. Let's, let's put it in Emma's hands instead. I like that better. Uh, S tier. I don't know. Yeah, that's what I, that's my point. I don't want A tier. I want S tier. Put it in Nemesis hands. That's a good idea. Okay. Well, I I don't know, man. I I feel like you're gonna post a Jun food list. I'm gonna post a Jun food list. I mean, maybe maybe you have like a ramp deck that you can post to, but like I'm gonna post my ramp list. I I think if you want the best Jun food list, go to Emma. I will share my ramp list, which I have had success with. Okay, cool. And I'll I'll share my Jun food list, which might be worse than Emma's, but. Yeah, Jund, if it is tuned, is a very solid deck, maybe better than Jeskai Fires overall. But if if you really don't know what's going on, if you are one of the people that qualified, you know, three months ago and haven't really been playing a lot of standard, haven't been paying attention to standard, I think Jeskai Fires is probably the best bet for you. Any wild cards on your radar? Anything you've seen over the past few days in the queues that caught you by surprise and made you say, oh, maybe this is something. I know Bant Adventures, Crokies was popularizing that, maybe going back about a week or so. I played a bit with it, pretty low on it overall, wasn't really impressed, but certainly there was a moment where it was proliferating pretty hard. Uh, I have seen mono white aggro from time to time, which surprised me, but somebody's pushing that deck on people because it it was not limited. It was at several times I played against right. it. Anything else catching your eyes in the queues? Well, I mean, Golgari Adventures is still a thing. I do think that kind of at this point, it's mostly been proven to be pretty poor against a lot of the decks that exist currently in the metagame. But I know that that's going to be a deck that people play as well. But mm-hmm. as far as like weird under the radar things, I mean, nothing. nothing's really impressed me. It's just like, this seems like a bad version of X. And I think for the most part, that yeah. sort of thing holds true. Uh, I mean, Teamer Adventures was one of those decks that top aided Portland. Uh, so right. it could potentially be a, a thing like you could play it and be successful. I don't necessarily think that it is the thing that would lead to you having the best win percentage overall. But like there's a lot of viable or semi viable things along those lines. Yeah. And you know, there's archetype familiarity on both sides. If your opponents haven't played against a lot of teamer adventures, maybe you get some points there. Uh, If you have been playing it for months and months for some sick reason, maybe you know exactly how to tune that list for the expected metagame. Uh, So there's, there's always weird wrinkles to be seen. I'm sure this is not going to be straight chalk. There's going to be something that we don't expect that does particularly well in this tournament. And I, it wouldn't surprise me if people have been holding technology for a little while with no real big standard tournaments to play. If you had a good deck a month ago, shut up. Like you shouldn't have told anyone you should be waiting for this point. And maybe that's going to happen. Maybe somebody will unleash something. Well, I don't think that that's necessarily true just because of how quickly things are changing. It would have to be like true. It has to be a Kethis situation, right? Like you've found something actually special that is just on a different level than anything else. Not a, Oh, I have a good, you know, Golgari aggro deck. Right, right. And maybe maybe that exists. I mean, realistically, uh, this this format, it, it's been explored a decent amount, but there are also a lot of powerful cards that you can potentially build around. And, you know, maybe 
someone has found a, a very excellent version of one of those decks. I don't know. I, it wouldn't surprise me because the last two iterations of this tournament, there have been very good decks to come out of those tournaments. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll see. I mean, it, it's also going to be weird because the deck lists are going to get posted and then it's like, oh, okay, well, now we're on to Theros. So maybe none of this matters, but... <laughs> right. Yeah, weird timing. It's a weird timing for the, for this tournament, for sure. I think this is the back end uh, and it's really hard to keep people invested for this long, especially given how tumultuous tumultuous this has all been, uh, the bannings and the really, really unhealthy format for a long percentage of Throne of Eldraine's life, some of the most broken magic cards we have ever seen in the history of the game coming out of this yeah. set. It, it's been a weird time, and it's hard to go back to the well for one last blast, but I have my fingers crossed for something exciting. Yeah, me too. I... I do think that the timing of this might be decent. Like maybe it should have been last week, but having there be something at the tail end of a standard format, uh, like right before a new set comes out, I think is good because it, it does keep people invested throughout the entire life of throne standard, you know? And I think we kind of need that because sure. it's like the, the set comes out. That's obviously awesome. And then maybe there are a few tournaments here and there, but, once there are no more relevant things, it's like, okay, well, maybe I'll go play Modern or I'll draft or I'll go play Hearthstone or Team Fight Tactics or whatever, you know? So, like, there being a big tournament at the end of it just seems like a good thing to me. As long as people still have the appetite for it. And given the interest level, I mean, I don't know how much the appetite is just driven strictly by OP and how much is driven by a love of standard at this point. It seems mostly strictly by OP, which has some potentially negative consequences if you're dragging people into a format that they have mostly had their fill of. But I don't know. I think there's some people who still are enjoying this standard and have appreciated it throughout even. There's there's different ways of playing and enjoying magic. I never want to discount any of them. If you've enjoyed this standard, more power to you. I hope you crush this upcoming event and get your payoff, your long, your long deserved payoff for sticking to this turn of this format throughout its lifespan. Yeah, I agree. I hope those players get rewarded too, and I hope that they smash me very quickly so I don't have to spend all day before I get my two losses. So hoping for that O2. Eh, like a like a one two or a two two, I'd be fine with that. But like don't don't let me like six two. That's not cool. Right, right, right. If I if I play you at like six oh or something, you better let me win. That's all. <laughs> asking for concessions on the podcast bold strategy no, Jerry. i like that for, really kicking off 2020 not asking for concessions just you know maybe maybe just don't give it your all you know just, just go okay. easy on me okay so you just want to you just want to face bad competition <laughs> sure i understand you're you're washed you need that little edge ask people to just take it easy yeah. on you sure only one of the best players i'll take it on only one of the best players on the face of the earth asking for a little bit of a break just give them a break guys that's all let him slide. Is that too much to ask? <laughs> it feels like a lot, to be honest with you. All right, fair enough. I'll, I'll take that under advisement. Okay. Question of the week time? Of course. So every week we solicit the fine folks in our Discord for their burning questions, uh, ideally related to the topic that we're talking about. And the question that we arbitrarily select to answer will get a free Arena Deckless pin. Only way to actually get it is by asking us questions in our Discord. So feel free to head on over to patreon.com slash Arena Deckless. Uh, lowest tier gets access to the Discord. It is awesome. It is the best place to be. What? Also, in addition to the question we pick to answer on the show, I'm going to head to YouTube and I'm going to answer all the questions that people presented to us. So whether it was chosen or not, I will answer your question. Uh, you can check that out, youtube.com slash Arena Decklist. But only the question that appears on this show gets that beautiful Arena Decklist pin. All right. Question this week comes from Firemind12. And they say, as someone who primarily plays Pioneer and Modern and is fairly disconnected from Standard. What deck would you recommend for this weekend and Theros Beyond Standard? Uh, deck for this weekend, we, I hope we covered, you know, I hope we gave people some answers that they're looking for. Theros Beyond Standard, I am going to go out on a limb and guess what you're going to say and say some sort of Black Devotion deck. False. That is what <gasps> I would have said last week. Now, 
I just get to say the same answer I gave for this weekend, Simic Ramp, because there has been some developments in the field of Simic Ramp decks with an incredible, incredible new Titan. Somehow we're attaching draw a card, gain three life. Jerry, do you have this card in front of you? Can you can you read the full text of this preposterous it's card? Uro something or other, 6-6, six, six, legendary something, uh, 1 UG. When this ETBs or attacks, draw a card, gain three life, put a land from your hand onto the battlefield, and if you don't escape it, you have to sacrifice it. And it is escape right. GGUU five cards, I believe. Right. So for, for three mana, you get uh, explore gain three life. And then when you escape it for four mana and five cards, you get a six, six that also explores and you gain three life and then attack trigger explore gain three life. Good God. This, this card, uh, this card seems awesome in a good way. Not I like, this isn't me being like, uh Oh, get ready for more bands. I, I just think this is going to be an incredible, incredibly impactful card. A lot of fun to build around the payoffs with Cavalier of Thorns are tremendous. There is already a very, very strong Simic ramp shell that we can lean into. And it's hard for me to believe that this card isn't just huge in so many spots this is such a powerful effect it's your early game and end game and card advantage engine and graveyard payoff all in one it fills so so many roles for decks that look like existing simic ramp decks and there's going to be a whole bunch of other paths to explore as well without question i'm into this card i think it's so incredibly powerful on its face and also just a lot of fun to build around yeah, this card is nice. Uh, I'm in Canada hanging out with a buddy of mine, Jeff Fung, and we were just kind of talking about Theros stuff, and he was like, what do you think the best card is? And I was like, I'm pretty sure it's this thing. I know that a bunch of stuff also got previewed today, and I saw some chatter on it. Uh, I haven't been able to check out every single thing, but I kind of refreshed my my memory of what had been previewed like prior to today, and I was just like, yeah, it's it's just got to be this card, right? That's where I'm at right now. It seems like a power level you would not expect given the cost on the face of the card as well as just the recursive nature of it. Like this card is going to come back all game long. It seems like this could actually supplant Hydroid Crisis. Maybe you're just supposed to nah, nah, both th those cards are so incredibly powerful. This, but. this thing gets to ramp you and gain you life, which buys you time for you to you know develop your mana position and everything, and then get the Hydroid Crisis. Yeah, I mean, that all checks, but also I think this might do such a good Hydroid Crisis impersonation that at some point it will become overkill. I mean, that point is probably pretty far off. Like maybe I'm talking about trimming a Hydroid Crisis or sure. other setups where you just are ending the game before you even have to go to Hydroid Crisis because let's not forget like the big body attached to this as well. 6-6 six, six is huge for its cost. So hard to believe that this won't be very, very impactful, but in a way I appreciate, which is nice when I'm talking about what seems to be the best card in the set. Yeah. I mean, Theros from the look of it has a lot of cool playable cards and there are a lot of cards that might spark new archetypes. Like we have to see, you know, how many good aura type things there are, or just like constellation slash enchantress type stuff. There's devotion for every single color. So uh, th there are a lot of things that are, I don't know, just like very parasitic where we need to see the entirety of what we're working with before we can actually build sure. around them. But there are yep. there are seeds for a lot of different things. And at the very least, like we know that Black Devotion is going to be a thing. Like there's basically a shell for that already. Anything we get on top of that is just bonus. And then, yeah, we have a very good Simic shell already. And now we get this card and... Cavalier of Thorns on the rise again, it looks like. Looks like it. If I didn't already reap the benefits of hyping that card from the beginning, I would be reaping the benefits one more time. Unfortunately, I've already gotten my payoff. Oh, I still have like my 50, so. Oh, well. Now's your chance. Now's your chance. You missed the first bump. I'm about to get paid for the first time. It's great. Yep. So, uh, Firemine12, DM me on Discord with your address and everything, and I will get that pin out to you as soon as I get home in about a month or so. Just traveling the road, playing games of magic, living that grifter's life. 
I am currently recording from the back storeroom of Magic Stronghold Games in Vancouver, British Columbia. It is quite a life. That's that's a, it's a strange place for you to be, but I am happy you joined us from Canada to put this podcast together. It wouldn't be the same without you. Yeah. Uh, me too, man. Always a pleasure. We will see folks next week for maybe top 10 Theros stuff. Oh, yeah. It's top 10 time. Let's do it. All right. That's game. Good luck.